Warning, this is an automated alert from New Polity. Adhering to the following investment advice will inevitably make you poorer. You will probably still be able to afford a fox den or bird nest, but luxury sedans may be hard to come by. Please proceed accordingly. Thank you. Well, welcome to Good Money, everybody. I am Jacob on the other side of the Atlantic from Mark. And that's Whoa, Mark You're on, not the here? Other, on the other side of the Atlantic from me. Oh, man. It's lonely out here. We've got a picture of you taped up to the camera. You look like you're going to kill me because Alex tried to dry it, draw it, and he drew it without pupils. Ooh, that's scary. Uh, but it's what I need. I'm a relational being. I can't possibly be an I without a thou, and cameras aren't cutting it as far as being thous. So now we have a little Sharpie, yep. Sharpie picture of Jacob. Looking good, man. I'm a little scared about today because we're going to talk about 401ks, and this is a little bit intimidating because 401ks yeah. are not just... Um, they're not just something to sort of stampede over. There's a certain eggshell eggshell tread that one must adopt because, I mean, my father is in a 401k plan. Most of the people I love and respect are a part of it. Um, it's given as the, a very prudent and um, normal way of taking care of your money and so taking care of other people. So to have any kind of critique of a 401k, a lot of emotions, a lot of feelings, a lot of people. Yep, feeling it up. Well, I do think... <laughs> feeling it up. That's crude. There's I'm a crudity sorry. there. Good thing that we I have clean and pure minds. I didn't intend it. I didn't intend it. <laughs> That's a sign of purity. It's the it's the people who have fully mastered their souls that always end up saying things. That's, you know, because they, they have that kind of purity, so they can just say feeling it up. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Lead us Thanks, in our 401k man. forest. Well, no, I agree. I just want to reiterate that. And I think there's kind of two things that I want to slowly toss out there as, as well is that one, uh, I hope this doesn't sound too harsh in a certain way towards any, any one person or anybody listening, because this is uncommon. And Though we don't know just, you, we love you dearly. We're yeah, full of compassion for you. Hug. I promise. I give you a hug. I would give you a hug if you were before me. <laughs> the other thing that is that um, whatever conclusion we come to, and indeed we've already spoiled it, we have a critique of 401ks for you, mm -hmm. um, that, sorry, I'm reaching for something, that the uh, thing to do if you are convinced by this argument is not necessary to rush into canceling it. And we we think that this great transition out of a liberal society and into the good Christian kingdom of God is something that will take some time. It has to be absolutely deliberate, um, but at the same time, it doesn't have to be rushed. And so, uh, so those are my two. No, I mean, this is true. Like I have a really strong critique of the car. I find the car is a net negative for humanity, but when I went out and slashed my tires, my wife had issues, and I think that yeah, this is relevant. Don't I had to come over, <laughs> your, and I never changed a tire on. before, and so it was, just, <laughs> it was a mess. So similarly, <laughs> we are a part of this world. We're a part of these systems. We're born into them. We're raised into them. We're habituated into them. So there is a matter of prudence, right now. But prudence can't be a code word for cowardice. This is what happens a lot of the time: is that we as Christians, throw around these ideas of prudence and, and carefulness, um, by which we mean nothing should change. There is no radical solution. Keep your heads down, keep going. So mm -hmm. the trick is to say, no, the prudence is in how we are radical, not in whether we are radical, right? Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Can't be said enough, because I do think that there's a claim that we often hear about it's just irresponsible to use your money in the ways that uh, Christ tells us to use our money because mm -hmm. Christ doesn't mince his words in the gospel mm -hmm. when, when it's not just to the one wealthy man that he says to give everything away. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a completely new vision of how to use your money that Christ sets forth and people will often say, yeah, 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 but that's for God. That's not necessarily for me, or he doesn't expect that from me. Sure. And, and I think Mark's point, your point is just perfect. It's that 
well, how do we start to enter into the radicality of God himself, and which is the entirety of our life. So, Well, you might be more like me and don't have any idea what a 401k is. I think we should cover it from some kind of starting point, um, which I think can be helpful to even people who think they do know what it is or who just have it habitually. What's a 401k? How did we get here so we can know where to go? Yeah. Oh, well, 401ks are the most popular retirement plans in America today. Hmm. 32% of Americans have them. So yeah, it's just about a third, but that is almost 60% of all employed right. Americans. Gotcha. So that's a, kind of an important stat. So it's, while it's kind of a, a, a strong minority overall, it's a, it's a very strong majority as it pertains to the working class. And the uh, the four hundred one k is really, I, in my mind, I see it as kind of a consummation of the retirement plans that emerged during modernity. Okay. So during the Middle Ages, you just did not have retirement plans at all. Huh. You had friends. So that's really the thing. You had family. You had productive property. You had the expectation that uh, you are going to be taken care of because naturally you have these. Uh, these stages in life where as a baby, you need to be taken care of as an old man, you need to be taken care of. And in the middle, you take care of both the younger and the older. And right. the same assumption really holds true today. It's just whether or not, you know, the people who are taking care of you mm. in your old age or not. Um, that's kind of one of our truisms about money that we mention all the time is that money takes a place of where love lacks. As it comes to retirement, we we still need to be taken care of. There's no way around it. It's just whether or not we know the people who are doing or really taking care of us, sure. or whether we're paying somebody else sure. to do it. And so we're and so the 401k, the retirement plan, is really what one, one such way. So to to do that, to not be a burden on people that we know, and rather pay, be able to pay people that. We don't know to take care of us. Um, one and then two to be able to stop working earlier. And mm -hmm. we've kind of already discussed an idea of retirement in an earlier podcast. And so, anyways, this is kind of getting too tangential, long-winded. But all to say, in the Middle Ages, you didn't have a retirement account. And the first time that that emer that idea emerged again um, is in Bismarck's Germany. You said emerged again. What do you mean? I mean that there were, in a sense, retirement plans, that, and that was that in that I know of at least is in the Roman, uh, the the imperial times of Rome, okay. when people were welcomed to join the army and kind of enticed to do so, uh, with the provision that the empire would take care of them once they were too old to fight. Gotcha. They would give you land. They would give you. Uh, house they give you money to have your servants and enjoy your freedom it's quote a sweet unquote. sweet empire yeah <laughs> uh and that's exactly how retirement plans quote unquote returned in modernity Gosh. bismarck wanted to bring all the principalities of germany together he needed a strong army to do so he enticed more people to join that strong army or to make that army strong uh, by encouraging them to join with a retirement plan. Makes sense. And, I, and yeah. I think right at the beginning, this is a really important point, and it's going to come up later, that you can't offer retirement plans apart from beginning uh, a regime of incentive, right? So like insofar as your retirement plan and whatever form it takes is always from another, there's always a certain way in, in which that other, you know, can use that retirement plan for certain ends, which may or may not be your ends. Now, within care, within like loving care, you want the ends of the other and your own ends to meet up in a perfect harmony, like a well-ordered ordered garden. Um, but whether that's the case in all retirement plans, uh, as they are today at least, we'll, we'll see. But okay, so yeah. Bismarck, so it's actually within the rise of um, nation states then, which is how I understand the unification of of diversity into a uniformity, which becomes a, a unified nation. Um, so it's actually within that project of nation building that 
uh, uh, retirement plans are, are developed and deployed. That's right. And of course, kind of the later stage of nation building is when kind of the big business sides of things start to emerge. Mm -hmm. It's probably a lot of nuance I need to give there. But uh, but the but the real genius of financiers were always, you know, a part of this system. But for the most part, they were uh, working for the crown. And once you find an independent group of, of merchants that are not in some real sense attached to or working for or uh, in bed with the government, uh, you find a new set of financial techniques emerging. And uh, in this, a new form of retirement uh, accounting began to emerge. You find the emergence of pensions. 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 So, what is a pension? <laughs> so a pension is, I mean, it comes from pensio, from, from a, a, the Latin, which means to pay into. It's a tax. So you are, Ooh. as an employee, paying into a retirement fund, or really in an investment fund, excuse me, that then is going to uh, provide for you once you do retire. Okay. Now, is it an investment fund? It was my, I was under the opinion that pensions were just a straight up uh, cut of a salary that's put away until later, and then you get it back. Well, so it could be, uh, it, there are two different ways, but they are often investment funds okay. that a person or employer would contribute to. Okay. Yeah. Now, the 401k emerged kind of by accident, when you say by accident, in the late 70s, 78, mm -hmm. uh, when you would, uh, when, when the government allowed for you to store away money that was untaxed. So mm -hmm. somebody was receiving part of their salary, was not receiving part of their salary. Mm -hmm. It did not yet need to be taxed. Gotcha. And really the idea, and this is, there are different forms of the 401k, but the, but the classic 401k is that you put away money you're able to put away part of your salary uh, that is often matched by your company into an, an investment account that then you are not taxed on. Right. But eventually, whenever you take that money out to be used, I mean, in your 60s, 70s, and in your, in your retirement, uh, then you're taxed on it based upon whatever amount you take out at that time okay. and whatever tax bracket that would that would put you in. So say you had $600,000 in that account and you were, uh, you wanted to take 60,000 out every year, 10% matching the market or whatever it may be. Then you're just taxed at that $60,000 bracket. And so it seemed like a kind of a good idea to people that I might not, uh, I can continue to live. I can continue to live on a salary that might be similar to the one that I'm living on now and that I don't have to pay an exorbitant amount of tax for it. Others, however, do actually put, use a 401k because they think that they will be in a lower tax bracket later on as well. So say that you're making uh, three quarters of a million dollars every year. Awesome. You, you're going to be taxed at the highest bracket. You don't want to be taxed at the highest bracket. No, no. You don't really feel like you can go through that each No, no. Uh, Too each much year. trauma. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, and at the end of your life, you're going to own your house, you're going to own your car, you're gonna, your kids are going to be done with college. You're not going to be spending all that much. You may only need 100, 150, something like that to live on. And so I'll just take that amount, which, yeah, I know. For us. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it sounds really it. sweet. <laughs> Go. I'm, I'm understanding that. This is, this is awesome, Jacob. I need this. I need this sort of okay. description. Great. All right. So then so, I'm just using it so that instead of having a big fat chunk of money, with, with lots of taxes, I'm essentially using it to not pay as, mit, as much in taxes. Yeah, so it's a great way of saving, so it's thought. Cool. Well, hey, yeah. this all sounds pretty sweet to me. <laughs> well, you know what, and there, there should be something that, that I need to say right up front, is that <laughs> uh, the early church really was not totally convinced that we had to pay taxes. You know, that needs to be set up front. Tertullian made this really clear as and 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 quite a number of other 
uh, scholastics, I mean, in, in particular, were saying just how unjust uh, an, an indirect tax system is. Mm -hmm. And then an indirect tax system is exactly what we have today. It's when you have to give money and you don't know what it's going for. Mm -hmm. So so I, I'm kind of, I, I really sympathize, more than sympathize uh, with with that way with tax of evasion. With, yeah. <laughs> you heard it here first. Jacob sympathizes with tax evasion. But I think that the mentality that it often goes along with in a 401k is uh, not the um, anger at the injustice of the state that uses money in sure. an appro inappropriate oh, yeah. way, but totally. just... I want to save some more money. Well, and let's be honest here. It's uh, it's from the state, right? So, you know, there's no, only no. so much rebellion you can do <laughs> against the state by using what they offer you to use. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great point. That's a great okay. point. Okay. But well, you then, know, okay, I know you looked at Ted. You looked into Ted's history. Ted, Tell yeah. Tell me about Ted. A little bit. Yeah, so Ted um, Benna. I looked down at my notes. If uh, you're just listening to this, that was why there's a pause between the first name, the Christian name, and his last name. Um, <laughs> Ted is a great guy who was in some way responsible for, they say, inventing the 401k, basically seeing the possibility within the tax code um, for this to happen. Um, that is obviously an inadequate introduction to a child of God, but that's what I know about him thus far. And he has a critique, so he thinks that his his little his little baby has become something of a monster, you know, which as parents we all know the feeling. And he thinks this four hundred one k thing has started with uh, some some good intentions, um, and has gone a little bit off the rails because, um, sorry, there's mixed metaphors now. We have a train and a monster, but we're gonna keep going with the monster train. We're riding it, baby. We're riding it all the way home. Um, he says that. What the 401k plan was intended was to basically achieve some of what we've already talked about, right? Like this desire for people to be cared for in later life, um, to have a secure retirement, blah, 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 blah. We all know that. But as it changed and developed by basically including more and more investment options, so instead of a very simple investment plan, it became a lot of different options um, for the ways that the 401k could be invested. And as more people entered into it, and as it became basically a source, a great source, I mean, trillions of dollars in, um, in revenue, revenue, it's not the right word, but money that companies could access through, through these investments, uh, it became the source of a lot of jobs and a lot of money for financial advisors and Wall Street. So now something that they really didn't have a lot to do with becomes something that they have a lot to do with. And he cited recently that there used to be like 0.1% um, maintenance, a maintenance fee, you might think of it, on these 401k plans. So like money that just goes into developing and maintaining the actual structure of the 401k plan. And that's actually jumped up to 1% now, which sounds like a little, but what it really means is that a, a very significant chunk of money is just going to the people who make 401k plans tick. And to him, this is, this is I think, his fundamental critique, um, which is that it's not supposed to be a way for Wall Street to make more money. That wasn't the point. The point was to give retirements. And now it is a way, um, yeah, it's, it's just a, it's another kind of investment game. Um, and so he, he, his advice is not a critique of the 401k as such, like, like we're going to talk about, but it does point to, I think, the idea that there's something uh, rotten in the state of Wall Street. Wait, everyone knows that. In the state of the 401k, <laughs> uh, 401k that it is... It is doing something different than what we are simply told when we're sat down and said, hey, uh, you just got to put money in this account, and then you're going to get more money out, and it's going to help you live a good life. Like, no one comes to us and says, hey, you're going to put money into this account, and Wall Street's going to benefit, and financial advisors are going to keep their jobs, and a lot of companies are going to get a lot of money to do the things they want to do, and we're not really going to tell you which companies those are. I'm anticipating a little, but the point is there's a real difference between what the 401k means in reality and then what is given to employees by their employers when they sit down to have the, the 401k talk. Um, so that's what I learned from Ted Benham. And so 
Yeah. Yeah, and I guess it should be said that everybody has a uh, – there's a critique of everything. And so for Ted to come out and say that I don't like the way that this is because it's a little different now – uh, you know, might not be all that convincing. You say, well, it's still perhaps sure. better totally. than another plan. It's, totally. you know, it does a lot better than an alternative pension plan or whatever. Um, but, uh, but I really think that for, for Ted to say that there's, I mean, his main insight is this, is that there is a leech on the, on the system. Mm-hmm. Like there are more players involved in the 401k than there is in any classic model of retirement planning or just the family, including the family, mm-hmm. <laughs> which was the medieval retirement plan. So that is uh, probably where we'll start to go with okay. uh, with this a little bit. We're, so let's I, critique. I, yeah, We got all okay. our pans on the stove. We got the butter melting. Let's make the 401 critique cake. Filet cake. <laughs> nice. Get that cake. <laughs> well, I do think that the number one thing that I'm I'm always a little bit uncomfortable with is uh, slavery. It just mm, I yeah, know it that's just, just it just me, bugs you. But, you know, it's like a little itch. Yeah, yeah. But you know, go with me on this one, guys. It's not that great um, when you're not able to exercise your full will. So Saint Thomas talks about four different types of fear. The first is a fear of material of, of losing material goods. Mm-hmm. Um, that is what he calls uh, material fear, fear, interestingly enough. And he just all out, con- all out condemns that as you should not be afraid of losing material things. Christ tells us not to, so let's not do it. Don't fear the one who can kill the body. Then the second type of fear is what he calls servile fear. Mm. And this is... Uh, of a person that fears kind of unnatural ordering of things. So, so like getting beaten up or bruised or burned or anything else that starts with a B and, um, (laughs) and, and really the, the idea here is that you are, you might be compelled to do something good, but you don't do it for the right reasons. You have a compromised will. So the classic example or the example that St. Thomas gives is if somebody comes to your door and says, hey, get out, and you might, um, in a sense, willingly come out, say that you're held at gunpoint or something like that. You might willingly walk out, but you, but if that guy hadn't showed up at your door, all things being equal, you'd have stayed inside. Mm-hmm. The only person that has done a completely involuntary act is if they are dragged out of their house. Mm-hmm. Those are the people who have kind of, in, in one sense, maintained their wills right, totally. um, perfectly, whereas the person that walked out has a compromised will. Sure. And and St. Thomas is worried that most of the time in business, we, are, we act by compromised wills. Um, hmm. the, so the other two types of fear are what he calls initial fear and then filial fear, where you fear uh, eternal pains of hell, um, which is the initial fear, which he also condemns as being bad. And then the filial fear is the only one that he says is good. And that's where you feel the real loss of separation from God. So whereas the initial fear was was still a fear of punishment. Yeah. And so you might act um, negatively. The filial fear is brings you to act positively out of your love for God. Sure. Now, it, so, sound, it sounds like you're saying that the 401k inaugurates a certain servile fear in people. Well, I, I think that's right. And I think it does so on a number of fronts. The first one, though, is that it attaches you to a particular master. It means that you really do not have the full freedom. You are inviting somebody to, to say, hey, come to my door. Well, hold up, hold up. Hold up. You... In, in, in what way, though? So you're just saying that yeah. that by virtue of uh, your employee, what? I don't even, I don't, I don't get it. Give it to me. Give it to me slow and dumb. Yeah. So, so when... <laughs> so one of the aspects of the 401k is that you don't have uh you don't have the funds until you turn uh, a certain age yeah right so when when you okay so when you and it is a kind of a choice of when you, when you pull out on these things but when you say you hit 62 years old okay and uh at 62 is the first time you're actually able to touch your money without some sort of penalty and tax 
on top of an extra tax. Awesome. Was, at least that's what they call it. Um, if you pull out your money early. Yeah. So in a real sense, you are saying to somebody else, you can use this. I'm loaning you my own money for what, what to invest in a certain set of companies. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes you, you don't have a full choice over what those companies are. And, uh, and, and at that point you don't have the control over your own money. Now, how does well, that it's, it's like you do if you are, but now there's a threat, right? So by giving you that, giving you that option, okay, you're going to put in this much of your salary and we're going to match it with another four or 5%, whatever of your salary. And that's mm -hmm. your 401k plan. Uh, w what you do is you now have, you've changed your mode of earning money. So at first you work and your work is rewarded. Your labor is rewarded with money. Reward is not the right word. It's justly compensated with money. Um, now you work and some of your money goes to this plan, right? Uh, which you're not allowed to touch, but which now comes with different penalties and threats. So you start to imagine, I think this happens, right? You start to imagine this money as, as sort of being out there. There it is. It's accruing. It's growing. It's like an organism in a Petri dish. Uh, and now there's a new source of threat. Namely, if I don't put in money, I, I lose this much. If I take it out too early, I lose this much. Um, you start to compare. So, so yeah, so now you have entered a different mode where you're trying to not do the wrong thing. You're, you, you have a little bit of a fear um, of messing up a promised, um, a, a promised land at the end of the road. Like you don't want to screw it up anymore. So I think that for most people... When they enter into 401k plans, it's like, okay, this is awesome. I'm going to get this thing. But then up until that age of 62 or something, there is a new fear that's introduced. Like, I now have to maintain this thing. Yeah. I think, okay, so there's, there's a whole number of different fears. The first one is the fear of losing that extra 4 or 5% from my company who says that they would match if I put X amount into my 401k. So that's that's kind of fear number one, whereas I don't think that that's a kind of a, a positive move that people make, because most of the time people would uh, if, if you were given the fact of 100 percent of your money now or or uh, or 96 percent of it now and 4 percent later, you would just say, no, 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 100 percent now. It, it doesn't make much sense unless you do have one of two things. Uh, one, the fear of not getting 100 percent at all, like of, of what you have justly earned, or two, if you do have kind of a, a real fear of retirement. So one of the two things, so you could be acting in, in a positive way, but that's still kind of a, but like, I think I there's a, save a bigger later. fear, which is that you just don't want to be a sucker, mm -hmm. right? Like if everyone's doing a 401ks and mm -hmm. they're making way more money at the end, uh, than you would be by just plowing ahead and working a wage job or whatever it is then there's a fear of, of loss, not in the sense of an actual loss, right? It's not like by not participating, like they take your money, right? <laughs> Which can, exactly. you know, you can start to think in those terms. But it is like, hey, well, compared to Joe, I'm, I'm, not, I'm being foolish with my money. I'm not making it, making it work for me and ending up with this security at the end, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, well said. So, so you, it really begins with a... Uh, with a threat of imitation, I think, sure. where people are. Yeah, so we've explained that. But um, later on, and I think this is probably the bigger the bigger problem, is that when you do come to retirement age and you do have your money, you still have a certain same fear of taking all of it out, lest you you know, feel the penalties of that totalizing taxation of 37% plus some mm -hmm. if you are in... Uh, in a good state that takes money from you too. So that's, it's, it's fear all, all the way down, up and down. And in addition to that, it does pull you into the market. And this is another thing. It pulls you into a blind market and you have to just kind of call it for what it is. You don't know what your money is investing in for the most part. You could ask for the documents. Most, the first thing if, if you, that uh, spell out which companies you're, you're, uh, you're investing in the first thing that those 
uh, that the the financial planners for the, your 401k will probably send you is their uh, their plan or their uh, breakdown of what they want their ideals of how to invest. Now, that's not really all that helpful because you might say, yeah, those ideals are great. I want to help those ideals. Like I want to help new innovations or, uh, you know, or green things or yeah, like let's help like, uh, you know, I don't want to invest in guns or beer or whatever, which I think is too bad in some, some regards, but you know, those are, might be things that like, at least I'm staying safe from, um, substances or whatever that are addictive or that cause harm. Sure. And, uh, but then you have to ask, well, okay, that's great. But one, one step further, what is it that you actually are investing in? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and most of the people just don't do the work. And, and that's, that's the truth of the matter is that the 401k plan is so easy right. to, uh, to invest in that you feel like, you just don't need uh, to to look anything up. You you decide to invest in it because it's simple, and that's the last thing that investment really should, investments really should be. They should be really thoughtful. Um, if you're putting your money behind a new venture, a new project, any venture, any project, you should know what it is. I mean, this is when St. Thomas says that it should be built up for the common good. You, your investment should be for the common good. Mm -hmm. And he's not alone in, in this. This is kind of one of these universal statements of the scholastics, uh, no matter what stripe they are, Dominican, Franciscan, whatever. It's like you, you, your investments need to go be building up the public good. And I think, And I think you can really sympathize with people because when this becomes the norm for investment, the thing is – they're investing in hundreds of companies, right? Yeah, these plans. It's not, it's an added, um, how do I say it? I'm just saying that it's designed for you not to particularly care. I mean, the whole point of what uh, Ted said, that it's creating an industry of financial advisors, is that's precisely the gift that the financial advisors are saying that they're giving to you. Like, don't worry, we've got it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that I think is hard because, um, we don't want to worry about investments. Like the, the point of the 401k is not because we wake up in the morning and say like, Hey, I want to make extra money by investing in companies. We wake up in the morning and say, Hey, I'm worried about retirement. Right? So the answer mm -hmm. to that question doesn't, do, it doesn't naturally lead us to want to go dig into companies and see if they're doing good things. Um, and it especially, and we haven't mentioned this yet, it especially doesn't, I mean, you, you couldn't even conceive of this working if there was an emphasis on local investment, right? Like right. wanting it to not simply to be benefit a kind of general common good or a national common good, um, however you would want to describe that, um, but a common good in which you are fully a participant, namely your locality, the people who, for whom you directly affect through your virtuous actions. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it makes it much harder at that point. If, if you, you, I mean, you'd even have a half, have to have a bigger financial industry that goes around to every local city and says, okay, you know, Mark, he wants to invest locally. Uh, I guess I have to fly out to Steubenville to figure out what's, you know, on the ticker of what they need and what they, what they're investing in. Sure. It becomes a, you know, so that's one side of it, or you just get to know your city, you know, yeah. on the, on, on the other hand, but the brilliance of the 401k is that we live in a globalized, you know, uh, world. And as a result, we can keep putting money be behind McDonald's and Starbucks totally. and whatever else so that and Amazon, they and just continue and to expand and well, every city ends up becoming I, like every other city. This is brilliant. And it, and it, and it, it, it is an important point. So this isn't a point about the individual choice. I think it's actually pretty removed from it. So this isn't a critique of individuals' reasons for going to 401k, but it is, it is I hope, something to consider as an individual when you're asking yourself whether you should have a 401k. Um, and that is that the whole glory of the 401k is its security, right? Like you're guaranteed, virtually guaranteed this, this return, right? Uh, six to eight percent, whatever, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, but the point is you're guaranteed a return. And usually that's all we look at. We say, wow, that's great. 
I'm definitely getting money. This isn't a risk. This isn't like that other investing where it's sort of a gamble, okay? Um, even though it is risky, it's always risky because investments are inherently risky. The difference between um, pension plans and 401ks in a large part is that 401ks ride with the market. Well, what does it mean though for an investment to be virtually risk-free in that manner? Like, why is that the case? Well, the answer is pretty simple, is that the success and power of the company's investing and in being invested in is already assured, right? So if I want to provide like a secure plan, I don't invest in like some young startup or something that's, you know, trying something new or different. I invest where there's already success. I want, I want guarantees here, okay? But, and that's, of course, that makes total sense. But then what does it mean? Well, it means that a portion of people's salaries is going directly to the maintenance of the status quo. So part of part of what I want to argue is that the 401k plan is a certain snipping of the bud of any radicalism, of any real change in society in, and in our economic models, and, and most importantly, in the actual power structures um, that structure our society right now. It's like, if we are all buying into guaranteed returns, it means we are all buying into those companies that currently have power over our world, right? So it's a way of guaranteeing their own perpetuity. It, it, it perpetuates their existence, right? By tying our fears of being able to survive into our old age directly to their, their power and their, and their um, established, uh, the, the fact that they're an established company. Now, I say this because Look, I can I if they were all just good, I suppose, and then it wouldn't really be a problem to maintain uh, the status quo of power within a society. I'm not saying that it's like necessarily bad in itself, as if radicalism is its own justification. Like, well, if it existed for a while and it's secure, we should obviously break it. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But I think we know right now that we live in the age of the largest concentration of wealth that human history has ever seen. The status quo in America right now is not some neutral, like, good old companies that just provide the good product every time. Like, we know who it is. Google, Amazon, Facebook. So we are, our lives, our livelihood contributes to their perpetuation. And the idea that they are, they have clean hands um, in the way they are structuring our world is just laughable. Right. It's in this real sense, you can have the comfort of retirement so long as you run in, you live in a world in which six companies run everything. Mm -hmm. Like, absolutely. The comfort is, is there for you. But it's going to become a very uniform society from sure. one to the next and even in your own. But I, I, yeah. Well, so, I mean, one one other thing is that investing in companies that are stable are, it's, it's kind of a strange modern phenomenon as well. Hmm. Usually just buying from those companies is what makes them stable. What what really needs and seed capital are, is the new radical things that you're mentioning, uh, the things that need to ha be started up. Um, and so just the, the mere fact that Apple has a trillion dollars in cash suggests that they don't need the help of investment. Yeah, so, totally. Again, it's to, bonkers. It's point. like, you know what it's like? It's like just coming with your with your offering to the king. He's already the king. He's got it all. But you're showing up. <laughs> so anyways, this so this is really the first and major problem. Oh, I guess. How many problems have we mentioned? Well, you the, said it, it, the, it inaugurates a new relationship to money. Fear. And then... Yeah, it, it certainly does. And then it also... Um, creates blind investing as a norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it makes a globalized right. world as a result. That's right. That is a result. It okay. But, but if, okay. But if that wasn't the case, we're talking about the 401k itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I give, I work with my guy, I've got a plan. It's just investing in companies that aren't doing evil things, but it's the same structure. Is there a problem? Are we just saying that the 401k is, is a good tool that's currently being utilized for bad ends? Yeah, no, no, this is a great question. I really want to make sure that, that this is clear. Is that, well, what if you had a, one like Christian group that really does a great job trying to figure out 
what companies will really help the common good that really need the money and that will really change society. What happens then? And I, I mean, at that point, I would say there's there's a few different things that <laughs> I would actually say. But the first is let's just look at the structure of the 401k anyways. If you can't get your money out until later in life, A, and B, you can't um, – that's actually a little tricky. If you if you can't, that might be okay in and of itself. Let's just talk about that problem because those companies might need that that money for a long time to get off get off the ground. So if you, you have a new venture, sure. it's going to be a little while before uh, it's on its own. It might be a little bit longer as well before so your you money can get is your locked money up in their coffers, and that's okay. It just might necessarily be a little bit of an illiquid investment. Sure. Com, uh, very unlike, you know, putting money in, into any Fortune 500 company sure. today. Okay, so that's the first thing. But what about that tax implication of, of being able to one day you have hundreds of thousands of dollars in this account and you want to take it out? Well, at that point, there's just this huge kind of mental block, like a psychological barrier of saying, I just can't handle the idea of getting hit with 45%. You know, that's just is, is way too much. Sure. And I really understand that. I think that's just a real like a, a real barrier because you look back and said, well, if I could have just been taking money out all of these years, I wouldn't have been hit with as much. So I think that's a that's a real, real problem. And in a in a particular regard, it stunts um, magnificence mm-hmm. in a great way. That's if you right. do find at the end of your life that you have an extra six hundred thousand dollars or out of whatever that you literally do not need and you want to help build up a new chapel in in your son's school or you want to be able to build up something great in your city you all of a sudden think oh i just don't have that money or i just can't do it i can't stomach the idea of it and and i so i and i don't want to complain about that i think that's just hard to to deal with and so a I would say that that is one of these inherent flaws to the 401k. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and what it does, it's interesting, right? Because it specifically afflicts a certain class of people, like people that have worked all their lives and now have an opportunity to, to, an opportunity to be magnificent. This isn't just an yeah. idle problem. The whole point of money for the Christian is for its use and its use for others. Right? There is no other justification. That is what money is for. That's the only way that we can have it with clean hands, is to say we've used it well and we have orientated towards the common good. So it's, it's what, what it does is it creates, um, for people that have lots and lots of money, right? they are able to retain the appearance of magnificence and great expenditures. And for people that make quite a bit of money with the 401k plan, they are the ones who are um, reduced in their capacity. So again, it's a certain maintenance of the status quo. Um, the rich are able to do this in a certain way, and then the people that would otherwise have this moment of wealth at the end of their lives, say, to do great things are um, cut off from practicing that virtue. Or rather, <laughs> they're at least incentivized not to practice that virtue by the fear of losing a portion of their money to the tax. Yeah. Right. And I guess this might be the one place where we can say it is that if you, if you might have some about retirement where you don't, do you not have any kids or you're kind of later in life and you can't make the transition or you can't depend upon anybody um, uh, or your kids have all run off the seminary or something like that. And you want to stick some money away. There's reasons to do that, but is the 401k the right idea for you in which, because you just do not, you do not know what's going to happen later in life. And if you have the chance of being particularly generous, which is what magnificence is, uh, then, then give yourself that opportunity. And, and in a real sense, don't let any barriers get in the way from uh, God leading you into that, in that place. Well, one of the troubles I think with our age, <laughs> that sounds kind of epic. One of the troubles with our age is that we indulge ourselves in a lot of periods of waiting uh, where we kind of imagine that the Christian life is attained at some later point in some better place than the here and the now. College was always a great example for this. It's like we literally take people 
in the prime of their youth. And for four years, we say, all right, you're going to enjoy this sort of formation period. You're going to live in a little world where you have a, like little restaurants and little games that you get to play, and you have your own little dorms, and you're going to live in this micro world, and you're not going to go out of it, right? And you're, gonna, and you're going to somehow, at the end of it, be formed as this being that's like, now you're ready to go out there, right? And it, uh, the opposite is the case. It just, as we know, extends adolescence and makes it into this sort of weird, I must join this social party called college because that's mm. where everyone is. And maybe I'll figure out a degree while I'm there. Um, that idea that the Christian life is something that you do after um, a period of formation is just wrong, right? Like there are periods of formation, but it's formation through act, right? You right. act so as to form habits. You don't you don't do alternative actions like, okay, by studying and thinking, I'm then going to become really good at applying and acting. It's, it doesn't work like that. You have to do it. So the, the point of the 401k, the, the prob, one of the problems with the, with the 401ks is that you don't, you're habituated to um, put money away for later, to give later, to help later, to be magnificent later, to be liberal later. Um, and this is a real problem because it's not like when you finally arrive at later, you arrive as one habituated in those virtues. No, mm -hmm. you arrive kind of as an infant in the virtuous life. And this is something we talked about in the retirement, um, in, in our concern with retirement generally is that what you practically see in retirement is not people being virtuous. And I'm talking about Christians here. You, you do not see a lot of Christians who retire with a big lump sum of money and uh, that they're just getting dividends off of and are becoming saints. Um, what you see is that they become like Jimmy Buffett fans, you know, like, is that Margaritaville or cheeseburger in paradise? I forget. I'm thinking of like, like boats, you know, no offense to Jimmy Buffett. My point is simply this. It's not actually building up virtue. And I think the 401k is one of those ways where we are habituated to um, save our magnificence for later, right? And then that later never arrives. And I think that that's problematic. And it's also socially problematic because it basically cuts off um, a whole class of people from ever ascending to real positions of power where they can do good. They just don't have a lot of right. power. They're, they're stunted. Uh, magnificence isn't just like showy just a way of like doing something big and flashy that everyone admires you for, though it is also that. It is taking a moment of real power to change the world, right? And if Christians are not able to do that because they're worried about taking too much out um, and get, getting a tax hit, well, then you have a lot of Christians that aren't going to change the world, and that's, that's sad. Yeah. I, I'll just toss two other things. These are a little bit more theoretical and probably harder to um, accept, embrace, uh, but there's kind of two principles that the, that the fathers and the scholastics unanimously agreed on. And the first was that if you want a prophet for, its, for a prophet's own sake, that's evil, bad, depraved, and needs to be confessed. If you have entered into to business just for the sake of getting more money, then that is something that you actually have to go to the confession for. The reason why is because profit, because it comes back to this understanding that the world was a gift to all of us. Mm -hmm. And if you're getting more out than is your due or more out than you need, that means that somebody else does need it and that somebody else was originally gifted that. That's what the universal destination of all earthly goods is. This is the original cosmic gift of the universe that God gave to all of us. This is a really important um, point for the patristics and the scholastics because that starts to reorientate everyone away from gain, glory, and honor, and towards the lifting up the lowly. Um, this is the great Christian revolution. But there's also another side where there's um, wealth without work is also another one of these economic sins, or, or product without labor is the way that you find a lot of the scholastics talking about it. And, and I think that the 401k falls prey to both of them. Now, you might say that with the whole product without labor idea or, or wealth without work, that isn't that original and to the frame of the entire universe? Like, didn't God give us all of this and we didn't do anything for it? And, and the answer is yes, of course. But when it comes at the expense of somebody else, and namely that somebody 
in a real sense, unwilling to give you a gift, did something to give you something, <laughs> to give you that thing without you, without you operating within it. Point is this. If you have something without doing anything for it, that means that somebody did something for it. Sure. That's my point. And, and that, again, is, is, a, is another frame of one of these economic sins for, for, the, uh, for the patristics and the scholastics. And I think that the 401k falls prey to both of those, is that we might say that this is for retirement, that I fear not being taken care of when I'm old. But you don't know what those dollars are doing. And that is a really scary, slippery slope to greed, where that you just expand into the infinite uh, sum of accumulation because you never really know what each dollar is for. And so you just get profit for profit's own sake at that point. And the second thing of the accumulation or, or of gaining something from somebody without doing labor for it, uh, that starts to strip us away from, from the or understanding of the dignity of work itself, of the dignity of others who are working. Um, and so these are two just great temptations that I think are inherent to the sure. 401k. Yeah. Now, what I want to, I want to talk about something specific to some four hundred one k plans called vesting, um, and I think this is important because it has also application to all the all four hundred one k plans. Now, vesting is just the, I think a a problematic practice by which your company says, okay, we're going to take some of your salary, five percent, say. And put it into this 401k plan, and then we're going to match it with whatever, 5%, say. Um, and you can have that if, and then the if is a little bit up to the company, but say if you work for us for five years, if you work for us for 10 years. And usually the way these these plans work, as I understand it, is that it's incremental, right? So you get this much of the match if you work this long, you get more of it if you get work this long, and when you really work for us for a long time, then you can have uh, the full match, right? And and this, <laughs> I think this is just straight up wrong, right? Because what it's doing is it's buying loyalty. It's trying to buy loyalty to the company. And I think it's important to, to realize that I'm very suspicious of companies. So like if you if you're a company and you're telling me like as its CEO or whatever like you know at the end of the day I'm in it for the for the good of all my employees. I always have to kind of add in my head like insofar as they're profitable to me, right? <laughs> um which maybe is cynical. Maybe it's too cynical. But it's important to say when we talk about companies wanting to take care of their employees in retirement I think it's right to be a little bit suspicious and to ask, okay, sure, but in what way is companies doing that helping them, right? Helping the company itself perpetuate itself. It's sort of drive for self-preservation and profit because that's what's motivating from the get-go. And investing, in the practice of investing, you see it right here, right? Like they are giving a gift that's really a carrot on a stick. So the gift is the match, right? And then if you work for them this long, then... And, and the, the, the principle is that by having that, you have an incentive to ignore other problems with your company, right? So say it's year four, right? And you're thinking, hey, these guys aren't really being just in all of their dealings with their clients, right? But if I can just stick it out for one more year, I get this thing. Right, I get this. Mm. This good, or it's year nine, okay? And you know what? I am not being treated with human dignity, right? They are, they are just making me look at the same spreadsheet, and they're not <sighs> listening to me cry. Well, you work it out another year, you get even more money. So just stick it out, kid. You know what I'm saying? So it creates a way for them to have an incentive, but it's an incentivizing system, which is, it, as an incentive, it means that you fear the loss of the reward, even as much as you desire the reward itself. So it's this inauguration of the person into a fear-based economy. Once they dwell there, once they live there, then you have this ability to pull them into different kinds of actions that you want, right? And the problem is, I mean, I think the problem is pretty obvious, but it seems to me that what it allows companies to do is to describe this activity uh, in totally moral terms. I mean, they sound like saints when they're describing their 401k plans. Like, 
taking care of our employees in their old age. And no one ever says like creating an inroad by which we can incentivize employees to stay despite flaws that they perceive in the company. Like, even though that's obviously just as true, um, that's not how, that's not how it's presented. It's presented as like, like a moral gift to humanity that you can, you can retire. So that I think is a huge problem. Now, some companies don't do this, right? I think probably the better ones don't. They don't indulge in this particular practice. However, Mm -hmm. the question I always have when it comes to 401k plans is just why, if, if, if it's all true that you want to take care of your employees, that you believe in them and you, and you want to, you want them to be loyal to you and you want to show them that you care about them and blah, blah, blah. Why not just give them a raise? So at the end of the day, a company is calculating whether it can afford to match, right, to do these plans, right? It's looking at its spreadsheets. I say it as if it's like some monster. Like a particular person is looking at the spreadsheets and saying, all right, can we uh, afford to do a 4% match on all these plans if we can sort of assume that it's going to be good for our employees and that they're going to want to stay with us because it's a benefit, blah, blah, blah. They're doing the math. They're doing what they can to predict, right? And then at the end of the day, they're saying, yes, it works for us to do this. Okay. Well, if you have the money, why not raise the salary? Why not give people more money that they can actually spend? Why, why put the raise in shackles, right? Like if, if they have to buy into a 401k plan, if you're like incentivizing this and you've decided that it's worthwhile, why only do it in such a mode, right? That it's limited in how they can use it. Right. right. And again, why not give part of the, yeah, if you, if you have you know, more profit in the company, then, uh, then you know what to do with in a certain regard, why not give it to them? Right. And the idea that you this know, somehow yeah. no longer incentivizes them is ridiculous because everyone's incentivized by a higher salary. I mean, call me crazy. I think that's something that we've understood for a while. <laughs> um, so now of course the answer that you're going to get to this is that well you're able to make mo- more money through these investments right so it's like the company has to do a little less because they are able to make money by investing it in other companies that are doing that are doing this work and again this falls under that same critique of the of the problem with blind um, blind investing and I think that it's important to recognize that that there's no like there is no way that the Christian critique of the 401k doesn't end up in saying that there's less money if money is your goal. Now, let me explain this a little bit. So I'm actually, I'm, I'm drawing a line on that, that rant, and then I'm moving on. Do you see? My hand is making a cutting <laughs> motion right now. So that, that is my problem with uh, directed towards companies who uncritically adopt 401k plans is that if they have the money to do this, why don't they have the money to have a better company? right? And mm-hmm. then it's always the benefit of investment, right? That you get more money by investing it. That is the answer, right? I think that that's a little bit disingenuous because I think the other answer that is not being told is that it creates bonds of loyalty through systems of incentives and a fear of loss and that that wouldn't otherwise exist, right? Like that doesn't necessarily exist if you just increase the salary, but if you can lock people into plans then it does. Never mind the kind of bonds it makes to financial advisors and such. But but what I want to what I want to say now is that what do I want to say now? Wait, it's coming. It's almost there. It's on the cusp. Here it comes. Oh right. <laughs> um, what I want to say is that the there is no way that the Christian critique of the 401k ends up in you having as much money. Yeah, this is important. For warning everybody, you will get poorer if you take this line of advice. Right. So the question is this. What is your work for? What is the money that you make for? If our orientation is towards, well, I'm doing this thing that I wake up, and I drink coffee, and I go do this thing, and I'm doing it for money, then the 401k plan is always the best plan because you will always make more money by taking some of your money, indulging within the incentivized programs that your company provides, and investing it in companies, okay? You're going to end up with a bigger pot. 
of money. Now, the downside, of course, is that you cannot access the pot of money. So it's in certain respects, right? So in the two respects that we've described, one, you have to wait till you're older. Two, even when you're older, you have the fear of taxes that keeps you from, um, usually keeps people from making large expenditures and really accessing that money. Okay. So, but in terms of money, it's more. It's always going to be more. And so if the end of work is the production of a number of money, then yeah, get a 401k plan and don't think about how you're being limited in your ways of, of using it because that will stress you out. Um, but if the point of work is activity, is action, is the use of the money, right? Then don't get a 401k plan because the access to the money that, that's maintained and the lack of fear is more enabling for you to act in particular virtuous ways throughout the entirety of your life, not just when you're old. And when you're old, you're not struck with the fear of loss through taxation, okay? But I can clearly point out these two ways of doing it, one which I think is pagan, the other which I think is Christian. But don't get me wrong, it's not like you're talking about the same sum. <laughs> the investment makes money, that's why we do it. Um, but if part of Christianity is, is to no longer say that you can pursue money for its own sake, if you really believe that, if, it, if it's not just a word you say, but it's, it's it, it real intention that the point of all of this life is to do good, become virtuous, and lift up the weak unto the full stature of Christ, then the 401k plan is not for you. That's just all I have to say about that now. <laughs> <laughs> So, so really, really practical. A lot of this has already been practical, but let's just kind of break it down for everybody. Say you're young, you have a very uh, small, itty bitty, cute 401k. I'd say empty it out. Start again. Figure out what you're, what you really want to be saving for and investing in. Uh, Jacob, can I can I ask something in this regard? Yeah. Go. Yeah. Do you think it would be good advice? And I'm and I'm being tentative here because I know nothing, and maybe you know nothing too. I might know nothing. Yeah. But do you think that companies would be at all responsive? So if you're in that state uh, where you're young and maybe you work for a company, mm -hmm. to say mm -hmm. approach them and just say, "Hey, can I have my money just straight up?" Is that even a thing? <laughs> like you you're going to put all this money into this 401k. I want to work for you. I'm excited to work for you. Can I have the money? You know what? It's going to be such a paradigm shift for the company. What if, if you ask them, hey, all right, all right, don't give me the money, but don't invest the money either, okay? So forget investments. If you want to give me a match that I can't access, and I want to help you become holier by not blindly investing money, can you just give me my match at the end of however many years you're going to do it otherwise? Well, I, th I think we, we have a mutual friend that's tried that yeah. at a particular company that he works for. Okay. And uh, they said, no, you just lose this money altogether. Oh, right. So, yeah. So that's my one experience with this. So, again, I like you. Can I ask one more up. question, which I realize yeah, yeah. I probably should have done this before we hit record? <laughs> Why? Why do they have oh. to say no? Like, what's the problem? Just don't. It, you're putting the money in it anyways. Why not just give it to you? Uh, what, what's the deal? The more money that's in the company's overall account with the financial advisors brings down the financial fee. That's the reason why. Those... <laughs> Are you serious? So that's, that's Are you serious? I, I'm not joking. That's the reason. Yeah. I, don't, don't look at me like that. I'm sorry. It's, I'm, it's a picture scary. of you without pupils, so it's very easy to just like blast you with the rage I'm feeling right now. It's, I don't have a lot of sympathy for this Sharpie Jacob. Uh, so wait, I'm sorry. To be clear, Wall Street has a gun to the head of every company, and we're cool with that? Well, I mean, that's true. But we've we've Wall Street controls so much more than, than we realize. The fact that the financial industry has grown by about 3x in the last 40 years suggests that there's more money to be made in controlling people than in producing goods. Let's talk about something else. <laughs> Ugh.
Okay, so the, none of those things will work. You just have to pull your money out of a 401k. You just have to you have to just jump ship if you're a young man with with nothing to lose. Yeah, or a young I woman. think that's right. I think it, a lot of this really comes down to <sighs> prudence. Okay. That I've heard of her. And and prudence in the understanding of how you defined it at the beginning of of a slow strategic uh, figuring out of how to be radical as God is finding God there. Um, if you're, if you're in your mid fifties, then I would say, hold on and, and, tr- and slowly take money out more systematically than just pulling it all out at, at once. Okay. Figuring out also, because you need to figure out where, what you're going to be spending that money on. And that takes some time. That takes some real thought mm-hmm. to ex- figuring out who your neighbor is so that you might see what he needs and what he's, maybe he's trying to build. So to be clear, that advice yeah. is because you'll take less of a hit in taxes if you pull it out slowly. Yeah, okay. I think so. And I also I also think that there's um, because this is so paradigm shifting, as it were, like the, the the Christian economic vision is anything but the liberal capitalist economic vision. Truth. It, it takes a while to figure out what what we really are oriented for. And so I'd say give yourself some time with that too. And and the advice here to the 50-year-old or someone that finds himself in this category, at least where they have a bunch of money in the 401k plan, um, is that, so there's, I want, I want to be clear on this because I think this really should matter to people. There's sort of two forms of advice here. One is to take the burden of investment onto yourself. And it is a burden. <laughs> Right, by taking that money, and if for, and if it is within your vocation, which is for others, to need that money, right? Aquinas says uh, you should only have as much wealth as your office requires. Okay, so if within your office, as father, mother, leader, baker, <laughs> whatever it is, um, you determine that you need money then those investments need to become investments that are localized, investments that are clearly for the common good, right? Investments in which you are taking a real part and not just doing blindly, right? So that your activities can be orientated towards the goods of those investments and not simply to the profits they might produce. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. That's exactly So that's cool. Right. But then I, w- I want to suggest there's one more thing that... It- if you're 50 and you don't find within your vocation that you need all that money, then don't do that. (laughs) And the reason I bring this up is because we are so habituated just to be scared of the loss of money that the idea of pulling it out and then no longer having it as a possible future thing that accrues is terrifying. But what we need to acknowledge is that if you come to the realization that it is not within the particular vocation that you are called to, right, to be dealing with these large sums. Don't invest. Yeah. How about that? That's a wild idea. Lose the money. You'll gain the money and you'll be able to give gifts and you'll be able to get rid of it and spend it and all the different ways that we've talked about on this podcast and it's awesome. You can be magnificent, you can be liberal, you can do all sorts of things. But don't sit there thinking like, the Christian response is to maintain the 401k chunk by other means. That is not the case. The maintenance of a fund is not why we live and work and die. Not at all. So if you need a chunk of money, okay, that's where Jacob's recommending new and radical strategies for investment. Awesome. Love to hear more. If you don't need it, just let it go, baby. Yeah, so two, two big things of absolute musts, even if you're going to take it a little bit slower, pull out as much of your money from their investments as possible, not necessarily of the 401k, because you do not know what you're investing in. And that is very dangerous territory. Take it from Pope Francis. He just found out that that the Vatican Bank was putting millions of dollars in abortifacients, that he was, that literally children were dying because of Vatican funds. He didn't know where the investments were, so he had to make a whole new oh. canon law of saying that you shouldn't do this. And take terrifying. heart, <laughs> take heart that the Pope yeah. 
is dealing with this as much as us. I mean, this is the yes, church is yes. riven right through the heart with blind investment. This is not something that like, you know, the greedy lay people are are doing or like the Knights of Columbus are doing. This is something that from top to bottom we are all involved in and we need to get out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's the first thing I would say. And the second is do take out as much as you need. I mean, that is the, just because because for this reason, you need to start to rehabituate yourself towards being able to recognize that money is for a certain end to be sunk into something else. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, you really have no chance. So two things you need to pray in two ways that you're going to be able to rehabituate yourself out of it. One, taking money out mm-hmm. regularly often. And then the second thing is is to pray, like actually ask Christ to reveal himself to you. Go before the altar, asking him to walk alongside you on this, that you really want to see his face more clearly. And and he'll answer that. But it's just it's just not going to it's not going to be done. None of what we've ever said is, is going to be done without prayer. I mean, the whole point is to be able to find that intimacy with God. And so to be able to. But there's just some real practical ways that we have to think through in, in doing this as well. And so ask him to help you through, through those ways. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, that's two sort of life scenarios. Um, what about someone who is done? They're retired or maybe they're retiring tomorrow, say, Mm -hmm. what about those guys? Well, well, those are, those are tougher guys. And, uh, you guys are tough guys. (laughs) Love you. Uh, I think the first thing to do is to, I mean, there's just so many questions to ask them. How are you doing with your kids? What's your relationship with them? Are they in the church? Like how far away do they live? Mm. You know, are, is your stability in, in your home uh, worth, the, worth the distance away from them? Uh, I mean, th- that's a real question to begin to ask yourself. I'd, I'd say, uh, is there a chance where you could go to them and say, hey, can we build something great together? I have money that that I've been saving up, and I've realized that having a, a, more, a greater relationship with you is is more worthwhile than than this kind of the stale sum in my bank. Uh, can we? Is there something that you really want to be building? Is there something I can help you with? Mm-hmm. Could we make this kind of a project that we do together? Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about. We're certainly in all of this. Not only talking about giving giving funds away, which you know should be what you do. You have. You've you've made a lot of money from those accounts. Give give your tithe away in that. Sure. Uh, but I think the natural transition point from retirement account in the market it inevitably it ends up becoming uh, a retirement account in productive property in a real relationship with your family. That's how the how the the Christians got away with it in the Middle Ages is because people had their land, they had their industries, and they had their families. And they didn't, they weren't slaves to anything. They didn't depend on other people's labor. They didn't depend upon, uh, upon uh, uh, alienated relationships that are lucrative. They, they depended upon one another and upon the goods that God, God gifted us. So those, that's what, I, what we're really hoping to push over into mm-hmm. how do you handle retirement? Because it's going to be a problem no matter what. You're going to be old. You're not going to be able to work. Sure. Family and productive property. So those are some of the things that I would suggest well, and, and, starting to look around and investing And Jacob, in. I would also suggest this because I, I can imagine for many people, we live in such an age of alienation that the idea of buying productive property in old age, right? So where your capacity for work is already diminished and the idea of just naturally and easily being able to turn to your family and say, let's use this to, to build, to build this family up while it may, it's certainly no guarantee that that's the situation that confronts a lot of people, right? Your family could be estranged. You could have, you could accurately know that your family would not be made more virtuous by the offer of the use of uh, the retirement fund that you deem unnecessary to yourself, right? Like they could be made more vicious. That That's definitely true. Um, so there's a lot of these situations. And I think that there is, there is a way that we have to just admit that human life 
is not something we choose from the outset. We are born into a particular time and within particular systems and particular power structures that are vicious or virtuous as the wind blows. And if you find yourself in a situation where you're dependent upon this system in a real way, you really are, you need it, you need it to live, you need it to keep where you are, then I think it is totally possible just to enter into a penitential mode where you understand that the system isn't good. You understand that you spent some time investing in things that you didn't know what they were and that you don't bear that culpability alone. It's as much the company and those who, who run it um, who have incentivized and even in some cases almost mandated a uh, plan of blind investment. So there's, But you can enter into a mode that recognizes, okay, this is not a good system and begin to do penance. That is to say, take upon that sorrow, that um, that sense of things not being as they should be, and offer it up. Because as Christians, we're never without recourse to take that suffering and make it a part of Christ's suffering on the cross and say, okay, my life, this particular economic life is not as it should be, right? So I'm going to do what's necessary but I'm also going to, I'm also going to give alms with it, to uh, expiate my sins, and I'm going to use my money in such a way that it is just going to doing good, and that can be sufficient, right? Like it's, it stinks to be part of a system that uh, is troublesome but it's something that Christians face in absolutely every age. Early church, people are converting to Christianity and they're in the middle of a Roman army, which they're they're soldiers, and they're a part of an empire-building campaign that has almost no sense of limitation, right? They're facing the same problem that you're facing, right? People converting in in the middle of being merchants and having greedy practices and then realizing that they're locked into systems of power that it's hard to get out of. They're going through the same sort of thing. In every age, Christian conversion leads to this consequence, that the systems you are in do not match the new heart that you've been given, okay? A suffering is involved, but suffering is just the thing you want, because that suffering is redemptive, because it's not just your suffering, it's Christ's suffering. I mean, fundamentally, He suffers the world not being as it should be. So when you participate in that, right, it becomes redemptive. It becomes meaningful and purposeful. It actually merits and lifts your soul and the souls of others and those you care for to heaven, to that place in which there's probably no 401k plans and everything is as it should be. So that's what I would say, because I really want to acknowledge that, (laughs) you know, it's not all like, it's not all like check, check my steps and just, you know, pick which thing to do with this bloated monstrosity that we're, that we're dealing with. Yeah. Well, you were very patient think, with me as I went through that, Jacob. No, that was beautiful, though. I I think I think this is this is more pastoral than we even uh, originally knew we were biting off, and uh, sure. And we've we've walked with a number of people through this through these emails and phone calls and and whatever else that we've been getting, and we um, uh, know that we're with you too. You know, we, this is, this is not condemnation. I hope, I hope you know, and I guess we'll, we'll end it with that. So we're just trying to, us included, we're just trying to see Christ's face more clearly. And, um, so think about what you're going to do, pray with, you know, on it hard and, uh, and find somebody to, to talk with you about it, but know that it is, you know, not wisdom of this world that Christ gave, you know, it was it was something else entirely. And and stop with uh, stop in with us next time for the secret satanic numerology of the number four hundred one. <laughs> Could we provide that? We'll see you then. <laughs> no, I don't think that's going to work. Rats. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah, thank you guys so much for going through this with us. Um, as always, you can send us a message if you have any questions, anything that we can maybe uh, help with, um, and and. And I'm Mark at New Polity, Jacob's Jacob at New Polity, and so it's that simple.
<laughs> See everybody. Right, Take care until next time. Bye.